All right, we are live, I believe. Uh, welcome to uh, Worldwide Neuro and welcome Daniela Valentin to Worldwide Neuro. Um, we have 120, 180, 1820 uh, in the audience. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. No one's complaining on the chat, so I assume things are going all right so far. Uh, it's a nice change uh, since I screwed this up badly last week. Um, couple of ground rules, uh, use the chat at uh, your leisure and post questions in the chat or in the ask a question box or ask them in the chat and put them into the box afterwards. Um, small questions can be answered by the audience, big questions obviously and by Daniela. After the talk, uh, I'll try to um, see as best as I can, which is usually not great, um, but it seems to be working all right anyway. So, um, short intro for Daniela. Uh, Daniela is a German neuroscientist who got her PhD with Andreas Nieder in Tübingen in 2010, and then switched uh, to uh, Songbirds uh, at NYU with Michael Long, where she um, did her postdoc until 2016. And right at the end of her postdoc, she got a big a big award, a Gruber Award uh, for her work there. Um, and with that, and with a Emmy Noether Award as well, uh, under her belt, she switched to the Freie Universität Berlin uh, in Berlin uh, and stayed in Berlin for just a little while uh, and relocated last year to the Max Planck Institute in Seewiesen, uh, where she's now a young group leader um, working on uh, Songbird still, on Zebra Finch and on Nightingale. And we're really happy and I'm really excited that she's here uh, to tell us about her work. So without further ado, thank you very much, Daniela, for coming. And um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present our work here today. So I will try to get, um, share my screen now. This is um, and with me and this is my presentation. I hope you can see um, can see it in presentation mode now. Um, so can. it's a pleasure to present some of um, our work that we are up to here at the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology, where we are mainly interested in the neural mechanisms underlying vocal interactions in songbirds. And typically, when I give this talk. Um, not online, I start with reminding people of the last conversation they had in front of the seminar room. This time, this won't be possible. So to put us all on the same page, I decided to show a video where you will see two people talking to each other and having a conversation. I hope you can see the video and hear the audio. It might be louder than um, the way I'm speaking. So you will see the video of these two guys talking and underneath you will see a waveform uh, which is indicating who is talking at what time point. I most definitely told you. You did not. Yes, I did. You did not. Yes, I did. Didn't. <laughs> yes, I did. Didn't. <laughs> yes, I did. No, this isn't an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's just contradiction. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It is not. It is. <laughs> so this is a typical conversation, as uh, one that you might have had in your life. Um, and what I would like to show you with this is uh, that there are two levels of complexity when you are having a conversation. So the one level is um, the, the higher level, I would argue. It's um, highly complex because there's some, some content these people want to convey. And there are also emotions um, that they want to convey and there's a context and it's very, very complicated and the content really matters. And the other uh, level of complexity is much simpler because what these two guys are doing is they do vocal turn taking. And what I mean by this is that one person is speaking, the other one is perceiving what the first one was um, saying, and then um, it's fo he's formulating an answer. So if we want to look at this as a much more simple, um, simple behavior, we can put this into simple building blocks because what they're doing is um, they're listening, they're processing the answer or the, what the other one has just said, and then they're starting to vocalize. And this is the level of complexity that I would like to understand on the level of um, single cells. So how are we able to produce this kind of vocal interaction or vocal turn-taking behavior? 
And um, yeah, if we look at it from this perspective, we can boil the behavior down to just two people speaking in snippets. And um, one, so the red person here, wait, I can I do this, I guess. The red person here is speaking. Then there is a short gap in between these two people um, speaking, and then the blue person um, is giving an answer. And this has this gap actually is interesting and has been investigated a lot because we do this in a very precise manner. So it has been shown here in this um, by by many uh, researchers that in all languages, actually, this gap has a modal value of 200 milliseconds. So the response time is really, really short. This is on the, on the timeline of shorter than your actual reaction time. And um, yeah, this is interesting to, to study how this vocal turn taking can take place in this precise manner. But is it really possible to disentangle it from the actual behavior of um, talking to each other where we also use learned vocalizations and form appropriate answers. And I would argue we can look at this and, um, and it's, it is behavior relevant even without language or knowledge of language because we are already able to produce this vocal turn taking in a precise manner but when we are really, really young. So here I will show you a video of two infants that are not able to speak um, with appropriate and learned words, but that are already able to produce this vocal turn-taking behavior. Maybe they're even having a very important conversation. So you just heard that uh, these two infants uh, were producing vocal turn-taking behavior without a real content, for, but for them it seemed to be important. So uh, knowing this now, um, I can turn to an animal model that allows me to study this on a neuron level that displays a very similar behavior without looking at the complex learned, um, learned part of the vocalizations. And I decided to um, use zebra finches to study this behavior because zebra finches, they execute short calls, um, yeah, many short calls per day. And um, typically they're famous in neuroscience for um, studying their song learning um, mechanisms so how their brain is able to learn the song. But instead of the song, I, I will look at the, only the calls. And if you ever have the chance to um, go into an aviary, this is the type of behavior that you will encounter. So these are many birds and they're calling to each other all the time. And so what you just heard is not the singing behavior, but actually the calling behavior. And the question now, of course, is uh, do they really do vocal turn taking behavior or is this just random calling um, that is caused by arousal and there's no structure in this behavior? To, to look at this, you can look at the video again or just uh, take two birds and then see how they're interacting with each other. So this type of calling behavior is used for a social bear, care bonding. So this is an important behavior for them. And um, here we put two birds in a cage and I will play you the way they're interacting in a second. But first, let me explain to you the spectrogram that you are seeing or the sonogram. So on the X axis is the time, on the Y axis is the frequency and in the, the, the color encodes which bird is calling when. So there's a blue bird and a red bird, and they're um, interacting like this. And I hope you could appreciate that most of the time they are nicely alternating with each other, but of course, sometimes they also overlap. So the question is, do they produce vocal turn taking in a similar way we do, or is, is this random? And to really get to the bottom of this, um, we decided to replace one bird with a, a, just a playback to not rely on the behavior of the second bird, and then to see how one bird is responding to this um, call playback. And this call playback happened every or once every second and is indicated here in white. And uh, the bird responds. In this case, is indicated in blue. And if you repeat this 
of uh, make the bird do 300 trials, you get many, many responses. And here in blue, the, the bars in blue are indicating the response time of, of the blue bird. And I hope you can see that uh, this bird is not responding randomly to the call playback, but rather at a um, very specific time spot. And when we now calculate the, um, um, the probability of when these, um, these calls happen, we can see that the response time of this bird at least is also around 200 milliseconds after the call playback. And we tested many birds. And, um, and yeah, in this case, we found that their response time is very similar to our vocal turn taking response time. Okay, so now we know that a bird has his preferred response time after another vocal partner call, but what about, is it, um, is it a flexible behavior or is it something that is hardwired? So can they uh, choose to respond at a different time point? Just like we can choose to respond to different vocal partners depending on if the situation is relaxed or stressful, if the person is um, talking really fast or slow. To test this, we took a second bird that had the very same response time than bird one. And then we paired both of them in the same context, meaning um, we paired, it, paired both of them with a one hertz call playback and asked the question, okay, will they then collide because they cannot um, change their response time or will they diverge? And we found that all the birds nicely um, decided to choose a different response time. So here in this case, bird one responded slightly faster than before in the condition when he was alone, and bird two decided um, to call slightly later. And we know that bird two was not responding just to bird one with the same response time he had during the alone condition, because we could look at catch trials. These are the trials when bird one was basically not calling and see that his response time was still later than in the alone condition. So now we know that these birds um, face a very, very similar challenge than we do when we do vocally interact because they have to listen, to listen to the call of the other, then they have to process this information and then they have to vocalize, meaning they have to produce um, a call and response to the vocal partner in a very precise way. So having this set up, what we can do is we can uh, look at the level of the brain to understand how um, these vocalization are being perceived and being produced. So this is a zebra finch, and this is a schematic view of the zebra finch brain. And one of the advantages of um, the birds is actually looking at songbirds is that they have dedicated pathways for certain behaviors. So it's not intermingled like the cortex, but actually these pathways are comprised of single nuclei. So here in uh, gray, I indicated the auditory pathway very schematically, of course, um, where the call is being perceived and being processed. And then in blue here, I indicated the vocal production pathway, which is necessary to actually produce vocalizations. And um, I would like to highlight one area which um, I will focus on today, which is called HVC. So this is not an abbreviation for anything. It's really just called HVC. The special thing about this area is that it is an interface between those two pathways. So it is receiving auditory information, but it's also necessary for motor production. And this is why it's a good candidate to look at um, what's going on during vocal turn taking. And one other thing that I would like to teach you about HVC, not only the name, and that's the pre-motor nucleus, but also that it co um, contains different types of neurons. So I boil this down in a very simple fashion um, because I, uh, for this talk, I decided to only focus on two types of cells, although there are two other types, um, yeah, which I won't talk about. Anyway, so this is HEC. It contains interneurons uh, and premotor neurons. They're very well connected. So they have a connection probability of about 70%. And uh, we know that auditory input is coming onto those interneurons and we know that premotor neurons are producing the vocalization. So they are the ones that are projection cells that send the signal out of uh, this nucleus in order for the bird to call. Okay, so I, there's a lot of arguments that HEC might be involved in call timing or call production because 
if you look at the anatomy, it seems to be the right spot to look at, but is it actually the case that HVC is involved? And to answer this question, we uh, could go back to the paradigm of the call playback experiment and let the bird call with these call playbacks in a normal way and then um, apply Bucimol, which is basically inhibiting the activity of those premotor neurons, which means that there's no output from this um, area anymore, and ask the bird to respond to our playbacks. And what happened was, is it's not the case that the bird wasn't able to call anymore. So his calling abilities, capabilities were still intact, but what happened was that the um, bird couldn't time his calls anymore to the call playback. So this is a strong indicator that HVC is involved in call timing. And um, to see how it is involved, we wondered what kind of techniques we might want to use in order to record single cells in that nucleus to gain as much information as we can. And we decided to use the intracellular microdrive because for this microdrive, you can record cells intracellularly. That's Cells, and we can also identify cell types by antidromic uh, stimulating um, yeah, these cells. And when we do this, what we have or uh, what we can measure while we're doing intracellular recordings is on the one hand, the spiking activity here indicated in, in blue. Sorry. Um, and on the other hand, we can always monitor continuously the synaptic inputs coming onto those cells. So we can monitor the excitatory inputs coming onto the cell, maybe resulting from listening, and also the inhibitory inputs maybe resulting from whatever the interneurons are doing. And all of this is possible in the freely moving bird. So they can freely move and interact with the vocal robot or with a different bird. And um, yeah, and this device is, weighs 1.7 grams and it can be easily carried by all kinds of small animals. So having this in place, we were able to record from single cells while these birds were calling and also singing. So first, I would like to show you um, how a typical recording looks like uh, during song production. So on the top, you will see a sonogram evolving. You will also hear the birds singing. And uh, underneath, there's the membrane potential, which is a typical recording of a premotor neuron during song production. I hope you could hear it, but here, here's the sonogram. So the zebra finches typically sing um, so-called motifs and repeat those motifs multiple times. They only have one motif in their repertoire. And um, so yeah, here you can see it was repeated three times and the underlying activity looks like this. There are some um, synaptic inputs shortly before the song and then there are spikes at certain times during song production. And if you align this to, to the uh, motifs and under, uh, yeah, align it and you, you will see that the synaptic input is actually highly stereotyped during song production, which is an indicator that the network is always doing the very same thing very same thing uh, during singing. Okay, so this was known um, already for song, but what about call? So we would wanted to know what happens in these neurons while the birds are calling. And that's why we recorded from premotor neurons during calling behavior and found that shortly before the bird called, there was a burst in some of the cells. And this was repeatable. So if we continue to record from the same cell and the bird um, called again and again, we could always observe that this, these type of cells were bursting shortly before. Um, this, of course, um, made us wonder if for the cells that we are recording, if these are the same that are active also during singing, or if these cells are actually a separate population that are responsible only for call production. And to figure this out, we simply recorded during call production, but also during singing. So this is the very same cell recording during these, these two behaviors. And we found um, that they're active during both contexts, although uh, one time the bird was calling and the other time the bird was singing. Qualitatively, the spiking activity is a little bit different. So uh, there are less spikes during calling than during singing behavior. But what we wanted to know is, is it the case that whenever this cell is bursting, 
the same kind of sound is coming out of the beak of the bird. And to do this, we assessed um, the spectral features that are highlighted in these two squares here to see if there's any correlation. And we looked at the call pitch and at the goodness of pitch and multiple other measures, and it's not the case that there is a correlation, but uh, it is really depending on which kind of circumstances basically the cell is active and if uh, a call is coming out or the song is being produced. Okay, so this was the one class of cells that we recorded. And then we also recorded other pre-water neurons. So this is the same class of neurons, but they showed a completely different uh, behavior. So what they did is they were inhibited shortly before call onset. And if you see something like this, some hyperpolarization uh, in sharp electrode record, sharp intracellular electrode recordings, it means something. So there must be some kind of strong inhibition going on. And uh, this is why we turn to the question, okay, what is inhibition actually doing? We know that these inhibitory interneurons are very well connected to those pre-motor neurons, but um, what do they do during calling? And um, so we could just record from those interneurons and um, and then see how they change the activity. Yeah. yeah. Someone's asking how the goodness of pitch was measured here. Um, so we're using SAP Sound Analysis Pro 2011, um, which is provided by Operator Nokovsky. It's in a software that is freely available. And there you can basically put in um, whatever sound files you want, and it measures the goodness of pitch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so. Um, yeah, so we recorded from those interneurons, and what we found was that they're, they're ton very tonically active, but uh, when the bird is not calling, but shortly before um, his call, they're actually increasing their firing rate. And now we wondered, okay, how can we put this all together? Because we have uh, three types of pattern that we are observing. The one type is that there are pre-motor neurons that are spiking, and um, we thought, okay, maybe we can look at the the temporal sequence of their activation. And to do this, we measured the spiking onset of these bursts and put it in relation to the onset of the calls to measure the onset time of these cells. And for the pre neurons that were not spiking, we did the very same thing, but this time, of course, we just looked at when the hyperpolarization was occurring, like um, when it deviated first time from baseline. And uh, for the interneurons, what we did is we looked at the firing rate and measured when uh, the firing rate increased for the first time um, above uh, baseline level and decided to name that onset time in response to a call. Is there another question? Well, no. um, okay. So now we um, have these three types and we have the onset types, times of these cells and we we could align it to the onset time of a call. So zero in this case here would be the onset of a call. And in red, you see the premotor neurons that are hyperpolarized, so that were not spiking, and their relative onset time. So they were on, uh, they were basically hyperpolarized around uh, 50 milliseconds before the onset of the call. If we add the interneurons now, they had a very, very similar time scale. Whereas when we add the premotor neurons that were spiking, um, they were active much later or much shorter before the call onset, which uh, might be an indicator that inhibition is basically going for it first, deciding to when to release excitation from doing something, and then the premotor neurons could spike and um, execute the call. Yeah, so this was our question then, if it's really the case that inhibition has the, the impact onto those pre-motor neurons to decide when to go and when not to go. And we could test this by um, performing intracellular recordings again from pre-motor neurons and then measuring their onset time and looking at uh, when the call happens and looking at their spikes and then applying gabazine, which is a low, um, GABA A antagonist, which is basically blocking the impact of inhibition onto single pre-motor cells. And we could micro, micro infuse this so that it was only very locally infused close to where the premotor neuron was. And then we could see that 
in this case, the pre vitamin actually started to elicit more spikes in the burst, and therefore it also started to be activated earlier. And if we look at the spikes per burst, okay, there was an increase in spikes per burst, but what, what was also the case was that the pre neuron activity shifted further away from the start of the call. And this, of course, didn't have an impact on the behavior yet because the microinfusion was very, very small and it didn't affect all of HVC. And we wanted to know if um, inhibition has really such an impact, we could just bilaterally basically apply gabazine and see if we, when we lift inhibition, uh, what kind of, type of behavior the bird is doing when we put it back into our call playback paradigm. So what that means is what we did is we uh, took a bird and, and uh, put it under control condition where it just replied to the call playback. And then we applied gabazine to lift the inhibition. And what we found was that um, the birds actually started to respond much, much earlier than um, under the control condition. So it se seems to be the case that inhibition is really controlling when to call or how long to withhold the call. And we could do this in a reversible manner. So here on the right side, you see the resp typical response latency of these birds. When gabazine was applied, it dropped up to 100, 150 milliseconds even. And then under the control condition, it came back the next day. So we did this in, in subsequent days. And um, yeah, it, it was a reversible um, condition in this sense. So now knowing that inhibition regulates call timing, we uh, no, I will show you a video where you will actually see um, snippets of a bird responding to the call playback. So he will have a head plate on that allowed us to head fix him and uh, apply the drug. And in the first half, you will see the bird responding to the call playbacks um, just normally in the control condition. And then the second half, you will see him responding really, really fast um, in the gabazine condition. And just for fun, 50% slower. Yeah, I hope you could all see it, although it seems to be a little slow. Um, but and what I would ha should have said before is that uh, sometimes you can't really see when they're producing these calls because they can produce them with closed beaks as well. Okay, so now we know that inhibition is regulating this call timing. But in the beginning, I told you that this is uh, can be a very flexible behavior because they can adapt to different situations. And we wanted to test if this is still the case when inhibition is uh, limited. And to do this, we um, took a bird into our call playback paradigm, and then we added a jamming call exactly at the time point when the bird would have his res uh, preferred response time and asked, okay, um, can you uh, move to a different position and in the control condition they could. So um, here in purple, you see um, that the bird decided to go either earlier or later. But in the gabazine condition, when gabazine was applied, this was not possible anymore. So first of all, you see that the response time was shifted to a much earlier time point. And also um, when we added a jamming call, the bird was not able to deviate from this time point anymore. So it was completely locked to, to the early time point. Okay, so um, what are we having now um, in, with the zebra finches is that they have a very similar precise timing that we do during vocal turn taking. And what I've shown you so far is that they can flexibly adapt just like we can when we talk to each other. Um, I told you that HEC is necessary and that inhibition is regulating this kind of precision when to call and when to withhold a call. And this is all nice, but um, in the beginning I was 
starting with Monty Python and having a conversation and that there are more complex levels than just this vocal turn taking. And um, unfortunately, in zebra finches, this is hard to study because they don't um, necessarily do vocal turn taking with learned vocalizations. And they also do not necessarily respond with an appropriate response because these calls, they are innate and they're always the same. So they cannot change their acoustic structure. So this is uh, again here the, the calls from two birds. And when you just focus on bird two here, this is the very same structure and bird one is also the very same structure. And when we would like to look at actually learned vocalizations and appropriate answers, we really cannot use the zebra finch because they do not do vocal turn taking with learned songs. So this is one bird that is just singing along. They're using these songs for a courtship behavior to impress a female. Females are not able to sing because they are lacking the appropriate song system in their brain. And um, so there's no vocal turn taking. It's really, really unidirectional. And this is why we decided to um, go for a different animal model that allows us to actually investigate vocal turn taking with learned vocalizations. And these are nightingales. And nightingales, um, they use their, their songs for defending their territory, but also at the same time to impress females. Only males sing the same than the zebra finches, but they do this kind of counter singing. So they have a repertoire of about 100 to 200 different songs. And um, they, yeah, at the moment, actually the season of nightingales, and they do this counter singing night by night uh, for many, many hours. And um, yeah, to give you an idea how that sounds, I will play it and you will see one nightingale here on the top, the sonogram again in red, and the other one, um, the second one in blue, responding to the first one. And I would like you to pay attention specifically to the first two um, songs they are singing. I hope you could appreciate um, that these two songs were actually highly, highly similar because this is a behavior that has been described before. What they do is that they match the song of their neighbors. And um, this means that they really have to listen to each other because they have to listen to, okay, what did my neighbor just sing? And also they have to form the appropriate answer with their learned vocalizations because they want to match their neighbor. And this is advantageous because while they're um, producing this kind of behavior, they're impressing females. And if you think of is, this as, um, I can sing what my neighbor just sang, that might be advantageous. Okay, so um, this is what happens in the wild. And uh, what also happens when they are singing is that they have, so as I said, very many different uh, motifs. But one thing that is striking, one element that is striking that they actually use many, many times is uh, this type of animals, uh, this type of um, um, sound, which is, um, which sounds like a whistle, like we would whistle. So they do this all the time. And uh, in 2018, when we first thought about working with these birds, uh, we went out in the night and John who is an excellent postdoc, but also an excellent whistler. He started to whistle to the nightingales to see um, what what they do. So this is John whistling to a nightingale in yellow, and you will see the nightingale the response in blue. I hope you could hear it. It's a little bit more quiet because the nightingale was a little further away. But when we took these data um, to the lab, we we thought, oh, this is remarkably similar. We, let's have a look at the pitch. And in this case, the nightingale was really close to, to the pitch that John was whistling. And then we were really impressed, but John thought, okay, let's do this again and let's try uh, how the bird, it, this might be just an accident. Let's try it again. And he whistled again with a slightly different pitch. bird responded again and not only using a whistle but something much more complex that John might not be able to whistle back um, but also in this case the pitch was remarkably similar and then within like two more two minutes later John decided to whistle one more time to see if he can win his territory 
And uh, this is what happened. Okay, so this is, I guess, was clear that we had to leave because this was the perfect match. And also um, the Nightingale just outperformed John completely. Um, so this is actually when um, the idea was born that we could do this this type of experiment in a very controlled way because the whistles, um, they can be generated artificially and we can measure very precisely how these birds respond to our stimuli. And that's why we decided to go into the field and do some field work, which I had not done uh, in my life before, um, and decided to not look at counter singing with two nightingales, but counter singing with us and with our stimuli. And the stimuli that we were using were um, either the so-called pitch test. So we wanted to know if they can match the right pitch. So this would be one example of a stimulus. This would be another one. And then we decided on a couple of, of more. And the second um, test that we developed was a tempo test where we kept the frequency stable, but we changed the tempo of the whistle, so the duration of the different whistles. And uh, with this in our computers, we went to uh, Brandenburg, which is the surrounding area of Berlin, and we did this last year. And, and this year, we actually just come back from there. And then one day, um, we went out and drove around and looked for all the nightingales that we could find within like 10 km kilometers distance. And here they're all marked with a heart. And uh, during this talk, I will just um, tell you the the results from eight nightingales from last year, but uh, this year we actually collected many more data. Okay, so this is on the night, but how does this actually look like? It's very different from what I was used to doing neuroscience in the lab. So this is the outside lab. You have a computer, you have an amplifier, a speaker, a microphone, and somewhere there's a nightingale. This is how it would look if you were to do this uh, during the day, but in fact, you do it during the night. And it's also very cold in April. And this is um, the right two pictures are more reflecting the reality. So you're packed up in your blankets and you record a bird and you vocally interact with him with your um, computer. Okay, and um, so this is how nightingale territories typically look like um, these birds like to hide in bushes where there are many thorns and uh, nettles so that you don't come too close when they build their nest because they are ground breeders um, but you can still it's convenient in a sense that they are not sitting too high when you want to do your recordings um, but it's inconvenient when you really want to see them because this won't be possible it's also dark and they're hiding somewhere okay so this is what we did um, and this is uh, just a couple of examples of the recordings. So in white here, you see this is a spectrogram again, the frequency range is between zero and eight kilohertz. This is our playback, and this is one nightingale responding to our artificial playbacks. And there's another example of a second nightingale responding to a playback. And you can nicely see already that they aim to, to match these whistles. But of course, this is uh, anecdotally, I also uh, will show you the data in an analyzed fashion. So first question was, okay, how precise do they actually produce vocal turn taking with, with these whistles? And to analyze this, we looked at um, the time relative to the end of our whistle playback. So the end would be at, be at zero and uh, measured when they start responding to the whistles with a whistle. And we found that they have two different modes. So they can overlap with the playbacks or they can alternate with the whistles with the playbacks. And this has actually been shown in the 80s already, not with artificial playbacks, but when you just simply interact with them with their normal song, they also have an overlapping mode and an alternating mode, um, which is thought to be a more aggressive or less aggressive strategy. Okay, but how about can we actually induce whistling in these nightingales? To assess this, we uh, looked at a control condition, which was, was recorded shortly before uh, we actually interacted with the birds with our playback. And uh, just to have a look at how much whistles do they use generally when uh, we are not around. And uh, we found that in 21% of the cases around um, that number, 
they're whistling. And when we're doing our playback, they actually do not start to whistle more at all. So they still have a whistle, whistle, a whistle yeah, they still whistle in 20, 25% of the cases. But what they do is they restrict their whistles to our playbacks. Um, what that means is when we look at how often there was a whistle after our playback, we get to like about 75% or so. And then we could um, just look at what would have happened if we taken the playbacks and put it into our control condition and then randomly inserted them, how often would we expect to um, see or to hear a whistle? And that would only be in 40% of the cases. So they really, when we whistle to them, they whistle back. Um, yeah, but the question was, okay, can they match the pitch of our whistles? And to assess this, we um, looked at first the control condition and what kind of whistle or pitches they were using in order to, uh, yeah, to whistle. And um, there are many, many data points. And to make this a little bit easier or more understandable, we decided to put a density, density plot here. So blue would be that there's a low density of, of whistles in this range. And um, yellow would mean there's a high density of data points in this range. So you can see that they have in the control condition, they're having um, preferred whistle range between 2,000 and 3,000 hertz. And when we simulated them now with our playbacks of 1,200, um, it's not very obvious, but it dropped a little bit to a lower frequency. So 1,600, yeah, we can also um, show these data with important histogram, of course. Um, yeah, it's uh, still around their preferred frequency. Then if we went higher with, with, and simulated them with 3,000 hertz, uh, you can see that this distribution is shifting and they are starting to respond more with 3000 hertz and this becomes even more clear when we um, play back a whistle with 4400 hertz that they started to respond more with this frequency so it's indeed the case that we can simulate them with these artificial whistles and uh, in a controlled way and they will systematically adapt their response and, and produce an appropriate output by uh, matching our whistles. On the other hand, we tried uh, the tempo test, which I showed you before. And in this case, uh, we couldn't find that they also aim to match the tempo. They rather have like their preferred three kind of ranges where they choose to, um, to produce these whistles, but uh, it was not on influence by our kind of, um, yeah, by our playbacks. Okay, so what we are having now is an animal model that allows us to study vocal turn taking on a little bit more complex level because it's maybe not precise timing, but there are these two modes of, of uh, their timing and they do it with learned vocalizations, which are highly sophisticated. We can control it by using artificial playbacks that they respond to and they form an appropriate response. So what we are doing now in the lab is basically we are establishing a breeding colony um, and trying to to breed um, at night again so that some of them are very tame already and some of them are sitting on some eggs right now so there's a lot of hope that uh, we can use these animals in the, in the lab soon and uh, the plan would be um, to do very similar recordings, what we have done in Zebrafinch to better understand how th these animals are able to listen to something, then to process this auditory information and then to convert it to a motor program that allows them to execute the very, very same uh, behavior they just observed in the auditory spectrum. And for this, I would like to Thank everybody who was involved. I highlighted John for his whistling capacities, but he, as I said, he was also involved in the, or it's his work, the vocal turn taking in zebra finches. Susie and Anna really um, put this Nightingale um, experiments up the ground and they were um, involved in the field work in 2019 already. Then um, Giacomo, Martin, Margarita, Nitash, um, they did the field work this year and um, Stefan, Linda, Afni, and Fabian, they're involved in a different projects that involve song learning and zebra finches that I won't talk about today. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Daniela. I'm still struggling a little bit with sound. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I think, given that the questions are quite, uh, they're concerning both the zebra finches and the uh, nightingales, I'm going to try to call the people to the screen to ask their questions, maybe first for the zebra finches um, and then for the nightingales. And I'm always scared of the silences that I'm creating by looking at stuff, but I'll do my very best. Oh, um, I don't know if this is working. Can you hear me at least? Well, maybe look at the questions. I was, I, um, okay, I see. Uh, okay, so should I start from the beginning? Yeah, maybe, maybe pick out the zebra finch first, right? The zebra finches. Okay, so the first question is were the neurons that burst before course projection also area X or RA? So these were um, RA projecting neurons. Uh, I did not talk about area X at all because only the RA part <coughs> is the C to RA connection is actually important for um, vocalizing. Um, if you desynchronize the vocal bird posture, does it affect what? Uh, Oh, oh no. Desynchronize the robo bird's posture. Does it affect the response timing of the actual bird? Um, so I'm not exactly sure because it was not a robo bird in that sense that there was an actual bird and that's why there was no posture involved. And it was just a, a playback. Maybe that's answering the question already. Um, okay, that's okay. Is there any effect of surrounding environment and song learning? Uh, I guess so. I didn't talk about uh, this um, this time, but uh, we have some evidence that it really depends on with whom and where you raise zebra finches, um, what kind of song and how well they, they find their song and how well, well they learn. So it's not necessarily related to the song. But um, yeah, my answer would be yes. Uh, the core frequency increased as well under Gabazine. Um, yeah, this is something I didn't present. Um, so we had a look at the acoustic structure change when Gabazine was applied and when Usimol was applied. As um, and um, we found basically a little bit opposite effects on the one up and the other one, um, the, the pitch in. Darcy, did you want to uh, ask your question? Oh, what, the follow-up question you mean? So I'm sort of trying to get at the question of whether zebra finches and birds in general, because their diurnal and visual information is important, integrate visual cues with auditory vocal responses. Um, you know, could there be a McGurk effect in, um, in, in zebra finches or in any bird? Yeah, so this is an interesting um, I'm not actually working on that. So she um, tried to stimulate zebra finches with other birds uh, or show, uh, showing females, males, when they were singing like normally and uh, when they were singing with a short offset and if they detect this. And as far as I remember, they do. So it is important for them. And the nightingales, however, this might not play a role at all because they're singing during the night and um, they're stationary and so on. But yeah, in the um, in the zebra finch, um, this is definitely a factor that can be integrated. Does that answer it, Dashi? Yeah. Yes. All right. Yeah. Answer. Um, I, I think it's wonderful to have both a diurnal and a nocturnal bird as uh, as study subjects. And it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. Maybe I can I can ask there a follow up question. What do you think is different in nightingales in, in in their brain structure? What do you need to add to the zebra finch system in order to make them respond and talk back? What what's missing? 
So what I think is what we have seen in the Riva finish is that any kind of auditory information is blocked out on their signal. And this is due to the internals we're just blocking it out. And in the Nightingale, my hypothesis would be that the internals actually act as a gate, just like in juvenile zebra fins, where they also act as a gate. Um, and they decide actually when information is coming onto those premotor neurons. And in the context of song matching, there has to be some opening of the gate because they aim to, to match the very same song. Whereas outside of the context of song matching, or even when they're just listening to it, then the internodes must just uh, could just gate the auditory information off because it's not important in that context. But this is exactly what we would like to look at in in the nine days. So actually, I have another follow up question, which is that. Blair Simpson and David Vicario showed a long time ago that there are calls in zebra finches that are learned in males but not in females. And I wondered if you had any plans to look at that. Yeah, so um, we're talking about long calls. And this study we only look at the and the big calls, which are the late calls, the long calls. Um, and they are learned in males and not in females. And we recorded during a couple of them, but um, we didn't systematically look at it yet, but it would be very interesting to, to see also maybe how they are being encoded differently in the male and in the female, right? And how the drug performance is. Great. Thanks. Should I go on to the mining questions or? Um, Daniela, someone was asked. Oops, had a bandwidth problem. Can't hear you. I think the host is gone. Maybe. Sure, so I can, um, okay, let's go to the, uh, I will just scroll down to the last three questions maybe. Does that gap between vocals varies between conspecific and heterospecific communication? Um, I guess what you mean by that is um, that if you, conspecific and heterospecific, so if, if you were to play a, a different call that was not a zebra finch, but a Bengalese finch or something like this, or even a, a noise. Um, yeah, this is an interesting question. We haven't done this. So maybe next time. And then the next question is, have you observed a de effect in social behavior in the birds with altered song timing? Meanwhile, uh, meaning is this precise to a millisecond delay interesting ecologically for interacting with other individuals? Um, yeah, so um, it's not always 200 milliseconds, so every bird has their own. 
know this might be a this uh, um, might be a certain hierarchy so for instance when you're the alpha male it might be important to always be the first or if um, you are like the subordinate it might be important to be a little bit more flexible so that you can avoid to overlap with um, with the alpha male yeah good question and um, yeah, the last one and the experiment on the whistles is there anything like a working memory subpopulation before the actual premotor transformation um so in most cases uh it is the case that they first have to hear it of course and uh, then there's a certain delay until they answer but this delay is rather short because sometimes they even overlap um, sometimes what we observe though is that um, when there's a playback, they sing another song and then the response ca comes out only as um, a second um, second song after the, the first song. So this it might be the case that they, there is some sort of working memory involved. If they first have to perceive it, then keep it in memory and um, then they can, can sing it. But this is something that we could also maybe test a little bit more. Systematically. I think that's it. Yes, Tanya. Uh, All right. Okay. Um, I think I I'll just say thank you here for everyone for this wonderful talk, and um, I hope to see you all next week again for another Neuro Theory Forum, and. Um, leave you and Daniela for the rest afternoon of the afternoon have a lovely weekend and don't forget to check in next time so see you Daniela Bye. Bye.